Hi, welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. We're going to be getting into something more about how the universe works, um, what electricity is. And because we don't get to control the laws of the universe, because we live in the universe and however it works is essentially made for us, uh, we have to rely on a little bit more mathematics, a little bit more physics type stuff for this section of these videos. And so what I plan to do is to go into as much as I can how electricity is, although nobody really knows what electricity is at a, at a deep level, which involves some mathematics. And I've chosen to include the mathematics in the video to develop them as I go along, rather than make a separate series of videos on mathematics that are unrelated to it or steer you to some of the really excellent videos out there on basic stuff. Feel free to go look at those if you don't understand it. For those who know this, I apologize if this is a review but I figure this is sort of a better way to do it than, than to do it separately. So Coulomb's Law, what is it? Well, it's essentially given by this equation right here. Um, it says the electric field, and that's this E, um, is given by this equation right here, and we'll get into what that is. Uh, another part of Coulomb's Law, essentially, is that the force um, on a charge, that's what this Q is, is proportional to the size of the electric field and the size of the charge. So what does this mean? Something called charges Q create electric fields and the force on a charge in an electric field is proportional to the electric field itself and the size of the charge. And Let's get into what that is later, but let's understand Coulomb first. It turns out that Charles Augustine Coulomb uh, was born in the 18th century. He died early in the start of the 19th century. And he happened to be a military engineer who had fallen on hard times, and he couldn't buy his way into the Paris Academy of Sciences, the university he wanted to um, attend. So because he was poor, the only way he could do this was to win some kind of ma major prize competition, and prize competitions were really popular at this time. And he essentially entered a contest to make a better compass, because compasses were how ships navigated, naval power was the thing at that time, and so this was essentially a military prize. Um, he basically did this by hanging things from a very thin thread and measuring how much they rotated, and it turned out he had the the best device for measuring small forces in the world. It turns out that even, you know, hundreds of years ago he could measure forces as small as about two and a half billionths of a gram with this thing. And it turned out this thing was so sensitive it was, it was affected by small electrical charges and static on dry wintry days. So he used it to measure the force between electrical charges, and that's what he happens to be remembered for. Um, his device itself um, looks like this, and you can find the pictures online. Both of these pictures are from Wikipedia. And so he's he's either uh, remembered fondly or cursed by students for hundreds of years uh, because he needed money to go to school. Um, so so looking at Coulomb's law, the first thing we noticed, the first thing I want to talk about is that a lot of these quantities have arrows above them. Um, an arrow above a variable is rep it basically means that variable is a vector. So so most of you know all of this. But but let's go into vectors. Now, a vector is a particular type of number that we use when we need to represent both a quantity of something, an amount, which is what numbers are usually, and math is usually used for, but also a direction. Um, so if this point out here, um, let's call it point A, uh, if we want to know the direction from the origin, which is right there, we know at some certain distance the line just traveled, but we know it also has an x component to the distance, right? It's it's this much along the x, and let's call that x naught. It's also this much along the y component. We call it y naught. So we represent this point as having two coordinates. It turns out in three-dimensional space, we need to include a z component as well, but because I can't draw well in three dimensions, um, certainly also not while I'm recording a video. We're essentially going to ignore the z-direction as I explain stuff, but all the stuff we do applies to that z-direction. We'll bring it back in occasionally just to remind you of it. Um, so, so how do we represent this vector? Well, some people do it just by giving the set of coordinates. They'll write x naught, which is the amount you know, here along the x-direction, that distance along x, comma y naught. Um, a better way to do it is to say the vector a right, essentially is equal to x naught, and we use the x direction by something called a unit vector we called x hat there, plus y naught, the amount along y, with a unit vector along the y direction. 
Um, let's go into these unit vectors for a little bit because these are actually actually pretty important. And by the way, this is the way we're going to represent vectors throughout this video. Um, so unit vectors essentially depend on something called orthogonality. And orthogonality means that the axes are completely independent from each other. So the y-axis and the x-axis, for example, don't affect each other. And the z-axis as well, if we're working in three dimensions, doesn't affect each other. So our unit vector in x has a length of 1 along x. The unit vector in y, and so let's label that x hat, the unit vector in y has a length of 1 along the y direction. We'll label that hat. And the unit vector z has a length of 1 along the z direction. Why are they 1? Because if we multiply anything by 1, we get itself. And so multiplying by unit vector doesn't change the value of a number. Um, it turns out that if we were to have a point here, and it moved in x, its y position and z position are not affected at all. The x direction, an orthogonal set of axes, uh, a, a system that has orthogonality, um, in fact, is com these three elements are completely independent e of each other because the axes are 90 degrees apart. Now, now, this doesn't seem like much. It seems obvious, but it's actually really, really important. You know, we could draw, for example, a, a, a coordinate axis. Let's get rid of our z-axis there um, to give ourselves some room, and we'll go ahead and erase some of this stuff as well. Um, but we could draw ourselves a coordinate axis such as the one that appeared here, that's not orthogonal. And let's, let's put an orthogonal axis in there just so we know. So notice if I rotate the y-axis um, some amount theta degrees out of orthogonality. Now if I move something in this direction along the x-axis, instead of it being absolutely independent of y, it's essentially moved a long way along the y-axis as well. So non-orthogonal non -orthogonal axes Essentially, if you change a coordinate of one, you change the coordinate of the other. Here, if the axes are orthogonal, then it doesn't matter. Um, I can completely shift something in x without affecting y. Why is this important? When we get to the future and we have some, some equation, f of x, comma y, comma z, in the x direction, plus some other equation, g of x comma y comma z in the y direction, these are completely separate equations. Just like the real and imaginary parts in a complex number are completely separate, if you're in an orthogonal system, each vector or each complex vector, if it's represented by an equation, is essentially completely independent of the other ones. So this leads to a couple of questions.